Mutual Fund Tax Overhang, sponsored by the University of Virginia School of Law, Public Law and Legal Paper Theory Series. So let's dive into this guy named uh, Ethan Yale at the UVA School of Law. I'm a, a huge, you can also find the SSRN, which is where I downloaded the link, actually, SSRN. So here's Ethan. I don't know anything about Ethan, but I found this paper interesting. I'm not going to read the whole thing to you because there's a lot going on here, but I am going to read you some of the, the, the bullet points. Uh, the built and gain in a mutual funds portfolio is referred to as tax overhang. Taxes imposed on investors who buy shares in mutual funds with tax overhang, even though the gain accrued before their investment. The consequence is accelerated tax, increasing the shareholder's effective tax rate. This article explains, one, why it occurs and why it's a problem. Two, describes the magnitude of the problem. Three, describes and illustrates avoidance strategies funds use to avoid the bad effects of tax overhang argues that reform is warranted and describes and evaluates the options for reform. So again, we'll just go over a couple things here. So it's, uh, I, I guess it's incredible. If you have a mutual fund in a taxable account, you just, you need to stop. Now be advised. I have no idea what your unrealized gains are. So before you sell that sucker, you got to take a, a note. Hey, do I have a big unrealized gain? Cause if you sell it just cause old Josh told you, you don't want mutual funds in a taxable account, uh, that could be problematic to you. So do not sell it unless you know what the heck you're doing. Mutual funds are taxed as pass-through entities. Fund shareholders are taxed on income earned by the fund in the year the income is earned. The fund itself pays negligible tax. This system is implemented by compelling the fund to pay out most of its profits as dividends and allowing the fund a dividends paid deduction. This deduction offsets most of all of the fund's taxable income. The dividends allocate to the income among the shareholders. The overhang, the overarching policy a goal of these rules is to facilitate pooled investment. This system works usually well. One significant cata, uh, caveat is the treatment of tax overhang. Tax overhang is the accrued unrealized gain of the fund's portfolio. So we got two forms of income from a div from a mutual fund: dividend income, which is fair. All right, they only pay the dividend out in that year of, from which is received. And you as a shareholder know exactly if you're going to be on the ex-dividend date, which you'll get it and have to pay tax on. The other is the unaccrued gain on the fund's portfolio. In other words, is that the difference between the value and tax basis of a fund's investments. Tax overhang and pass-through rules apply to mutual funds interact to accelerate the tax burden and burden imposed on mutual fund shareholders. In effect, the shareholder is taxed on the earlier of A, the fund's realization on any gain that exists in the portfolio, assuming the shareholder owns the shares when the gain is distributed, close to year end, or B, the shareholder's disposition of the fund share. So if I own the fund, I get 100 shares in Vanguard Healthcare Fund, and it's worth uh, nine bucks a share, but Vanguard Fund, as cost basis, is four bucks a share. That's a five dollar unrealized gain. If Vanguard sells some stocks and they recognize some of those unrealized gains, it comes out to me as part of my taxable event, even if I only bought the fund just yesterday. Does that make sense? Now, if I bought the fund at five and it's worth nine now, and I sell it, then I also have a four dollar capital gain too. So there's two ways to get taxed. Uh, mutual funds. The mutual fund itself sends its capital gain distributions to me as a shareholder and me as a shareholder in selling the mutual fund itself. It's, uh, it's confusing, but they'll get you on either way or both. A fund that has both, uh, both tax overhang and turnover in its portfolio would tend to impose a tax burden on the shareholders earlier than they would like. And in many instances, earlier than they would result from a comparable investment in a separately managed brokerage account. The greater the turnover and the tax overhang, the more the tax burden accelerates. Sometimes the rules result in taxable income passing through to fund shareholders who have no economic income at all, or even a loss from a mutual fund investment. I've done videos on that before. It's nuts. Uh, let's see. Until uh, let's see. Until the early 2000s, one could chalk up this issue as an unfortunate aspect of a system that, for the most part, worked well. True, tax overhang was a problem, but a pervasive problem that applied uniformly across the industry. But during the past 15 years, things have changed. Uh, some investment advisors have developed expertise in avoiding tax overhang, yet the strategies these advisors use are, are not universally available. 
only certain types of funds and certain complexes, fund complexes, has mastered the art of dodging this burden. As I detailed below, most exchange-traded funds, ETFs, are available, are able to play around tax overhang, and Vanguard and Eaton Vance both have tax strategy patents on avoidance structures that are available to their funds, but not to other funds, unless the other funds are willing to pay royalties to license the technology. Uh, let's see. Okay. Hold on a second. Let me pause and look what else we got here. It talks about the legislative history. Don't much care about that. I mean, I do, but I'm not going to bore you to death with it. All right, here we go. In section two, I define mutual fund tax overhang and illustrate its effect using simple examples. All right, so let's take a look. So he got this example here and I'm going to show it. We're going to go down to the visual of it. So what we have is we have this uh, visual example of mutual fund tax overhang. We got A, B, and C invest $1 each in new fund. The fund invests $3 in X company shares. All right, so A, B, and C each put a buck into the fund. The fund bought $3 uh, invested in th uh, that, those $3 in shares of X company. Fund portfolio gains 200%. So the NAV went from three, which was the initial point, $3 in NAV, because they invested $3 in XCO, and now it's at nine. D then invests three dollars for a, a fourth stake in the fund. So we had nine dollars of NAV. D adds his three dollars. So now there's twelve dollars of the NAV. D gets a, a twenty-five percent of the portfolio because he invested three dollars and it's worth twelve bucks. And fund buys it, but he only invested three more dollars, right? So fund buys three more of company X. Fund NAV remains uh, stable at twelve. So again, we started with three dollars. Uh, it went to nine, D invested $3, went to 12, and now it's stable at $12. And we, each person has essentially a quarter per share, quarter share. A, B, and C all have $3 of value. D has $3 of value. A, B, and C's cost basis is one. D's cost basis is three. Hope that makes sense. Fund redeems A and B for $3 a share. So A and B says we are out of here. All right, so they take their gains. So they have a $3 uh, they have a three dollar redemption. All right, they had a dollar they put in. They got three dollars back. All right, so they're paying two dollars as a long term capital gain or whatever short term capital gain. To raise cash, fund sells X company shares and realizes a two dollar gain. All right, so the fund sell because remember, we have uh, we have a cost base. Let's see, they got two dollars. The two dollar gain is divided by the remaining shareholders. One will be D and one will be C. They each get a dollar gain. All right, but does uh, D have a gain? Well, uh, no, because he paid three dollars for it, and the NAV was three dollars, so he has no gain, but he still has a dollar taxable consequence. Does that make sense? So he made no money. He put three in; it was worth three when he has it, but because A and B sold, there's a two dollar gain, and so someone's got to pay the two dollar gain, and it's divided between the remaining shareholders. So now the fund NAV is at eight bucks a share. Hope that makes sense. Eight dollars a share. Then D says, I'm out of here. I'm selling it for four dollars. Now he doesn't have a gain because he has a cost basis of four. He paid for three for it. He got a dollar capital gain. He had to pay tax, which increases cost basis to four. So essentially he hasn't made any money. All right. So he bought it for four. He sold it. He basically bought it for four, three dollars plus a dollar capital gain. He sold for four. To raise cash, though, because C is still there. C is still in the fund holder, the remaining fund holder. But to raise cash to get rid of D to redeem his shares, the fund had to sell X shares for a $3 gain. All right. Now, C is left and got that entire $3 gain attributed to him, even though he has done nothing. So C had $4 of capital gains that he had to pay, even though he did nothing. And that's the issue with the, how the, the stuff works. Now, I've talked about I can't remember what his cost basis is anymore, but still, that's how it works. You know, like C gets the, the bulk of the capital gains, even though he didn't do anything. He's still sitting on it. He's still sitting on it. In fact, he only invested a buck, uh, and he has to pay $3 in taxes, even though he's still sitting on the share price. And I, off the top of my head, I can't remember the share. No, I don't remember. Anyway, the value of the D's investment in the fund did not increase between two of the purchase and three of redemption. Uh, yet he was taxed on fund portfolio gain that predated his investment in the fund. Then the values of D's investment did increase between time two and three. He's not taxed on the increase because the shares were given basis adjustment because of dollar capital gain. But however, C though, uh, it appears the mutual funds are not tax efficient. Uh, does it talk about C? Well, maybe it's up here. So I do want to talk about C if they tell us. Yeah. 
All right, so well, I'll let you read the whole story. The story is actually pretty good. I'm sure I'm not explaining it very well. The story is wonderful in how the, he relates to how the negative uh, cost of D and C uh, from a capital gain taxation perspective. All right, so we're going to avoid the counter uh, rebounds. We're going to avoid that. There's a couple other things I want to talk about. Uh, overhang is unique to mutual funds. The ph phenomenon occurs because there are two taxpayers responsible for accounting for the same income, the fund and the shareholder. The economic burden of tax on income earned by one taxpayer, the fund, is visited on the other taxpayer, the shareholder, even if the shareholder has no income. Uh, that's what the problem with the mutual funds are. The shareholder is the one who pays the tax. The fund does not. Even the shareholder has no income or even loss of income, they still got to pay a tax on. Uh, and he talks about the other example you can use. He gives you a couple of examples. It's good if you're interested in this stuff. Tax overhang is bad. Mutual fund tax overhang is bad for three reasons. First, it's inefficient. Excuse the incentives of fund sponsors, managers, and investors altering their behavior compared to how they would conduct business absent such overhang. It imposes a tax burden on mutual fund investors that is not borne by tax payers and payers investing in their own private accounts or through private funds such as hedge funds or private equity. Taxpayers who have sufficient wealth to achieve investment diversification within their own portfolio and those who qualify for accredited investors eligible for private fund investor will tend to be wealthier and on average than taxpayers who invest exclusively for mutual fund. Uh, the third, the tax overhang allocates taxable income to the wrong taxpayers. This is what I might be saying. I completely agree. This is seen most obviously in the case of a mutual fund shareholder who unwittingly buys into a fund just before it declares a dividend and bears tax on income that accrued prior to his investment in the fund. The tax assigned to the new shareholder should have been assigned to the shareholders who invested in the fund when the gain accrued. Already, all right, so exactly. Um, and if we talk about inefficiency, it's inherently inefficient. I mean, why should you pay tax for something you did not uh, enjoy? It doesn't make any sense. Uh, see, Anthony, thought there's something else I want to talk about. Uh, I want uh, mutual funds versus separately managed funds. Uh, tax overhang is, is significant. By every measure, ta mutual fund tax overhang is an economically significant issue, both to taxable mutual fund investors and to the, the FISC. I don't know what that is. There are the FISC. There are way, various ways to express the magnitude of the tax overhang. Built-in gains in fund portfolios, which can be described in dollars or as a ratio of built-in gains of the portfolio value that drag tax overhang, uh, the drag the tax overhang imposes on net of tax fund yield and the relationship between tax overhang related drag on performance and other expenses borne by investors. Uh, let's see. The financial economists have estimated the magnitude of mutual fund tax overhang. Typically, these studies summarize overhang as a percentage of mutual fund assets held in equity funds. Uh, the most recent study relies on uh, some data. The average tax overhang across all funds was 12%. Whoa, a net asset value. Whoa. The composite figure breaks down to share attributes to long-term gains 10% and short-term gains 1.8. Whoa, 12% of the NAV. Man, that is crazy. I didn't realize it's that bad. I knew it was bad, but the magnitude of mutual fund overhang is 12% of NAV. That's freaking nuts, man. Um, that is nuts. Uh, for long term gains, the mean is significantly greater than the median, implying the measures of central tendency mask a comp composite of many rel relatively low overhang funds with a smaller number of funds that have very significant overhead on rel relative basis. Ah, oh, man, uh, approximately 80% greater for the mean for long-term gains. Jeez, man, that's freaking, that's that's nuts. I did not realize it's, uh, it's that bad. Estimated tax overhang and realized capital gains. 1996, 4.9% a year, man. Realized, jeez. Yeah, my man, Fang. All right, that's tax plan by mutual funds. The estimate for over uh, average overhang for the last three years of studies consistent with the more recent data in the first study. I, that's crazy, man. That's that's a significant. You're, you're leaving a lot of money on the table. There's no other way around that. Express in dollars. Let's see if we got here. Uh, uh, to put it in context, the most conservative estimated tax liability reflected in the table, $44 billion, will rank as the 11th largest tax expenditure. The highest estimate, $133 billion, would be the second largest tax expenditure, exceeding terms as such as deferral of income uh, from home mortgage interest deductions, capital gains preference, and I don't know what CFCs are. I'm sure he says it. Man, that's crazy. 
That's how bad. I mean, literally, if it's the highest, it's the second highest uh, exceeding, exceeding the tax expenditure, exceeding items of deferral income from CFCs, home mortgage interest deduction, and capital gain preference. Express as a drag on yield. All right, right here. One estimate indicates that the tax burden imposed on equity funds was on average 1.12% a year. And there's your 12% right there, roughly. The tax burden estimate includes both long and short-term capital gains plus dividends. Man. All right, so he gets into tax avoidance strategy. We'll get into that now. But essentially, by your tax overhang, you're losing 1.1, 1 1.21% a year in, uh, in return because of tax. Don't do that. That's... Uh, that's crazy. All right, I hope you like this. This is uh, you know, a big paper, lots of charts and stuff, and uh, you know, smarty pants guys, but uh, I've always found this stuff interesting for sure. So again, do not buy mutual funds in taxable accounts. Vanguard and Eat and Eaton Vans give you the benefit, but everything else does not. Buy ETFs and taxable accounts or Vanguard funds. All right, smash, and we'll see you next time.